we can actually you know plead this now um i know that we have not had a fusion in the beginning in the past because of half term and stuff so just i will briefly recap you know what we've done so far now because this is uh, one of the important units that we study you know um especially with relates to the uh, you know health and social care i think the uh, the main reason of studying international healthcare policy is that as a learner at the masters level you should be able to understand you know everything around how a uh, healthcare policy uh, or a healthcare system works within a particular country so one of the key mm-hmm. things that we have to look at when you start doing the assignment for this unit is you have to pick a country if it could be your back home country it could be uk we have discussed the national uh, you know nhs in particular the national health service so that mm-hmm. in this particular content you have to contextualize it to understanding the healthcare policy and its context within a uh, within a country so you could look at the na- na- nhs national healthcare service or on the model of something which we have put across you know for the danish uh, healthcare system so whichever system you are comfortable with we need to be able to understand how healthcare works within a country what is and how are the policy and guidelines set how these policies and guidelines then look at uh, um, you know, b- a bit of correlation with international uh, you know uh, agencies and then to a certain extent what we need to understand is how the healthcare system and its delivery actually works within the context of a country so we mm-hmm. have to look at things like culture uh, you know the implication of culture the implication of society uh, the attitudes towards healthcare and to a certain extent what we also understand is the uh, social impacts which basically the healthcare policy can have on uh, you know the people who make use of this system then mm-hmm. what's the uh, you know further learning outcomes that we studied what we talked about was uh, to understand how a healthcare policy can be translated into or developed into an action plan how is the policy actually implemented so in this uh context what we've looked at is when we looked at the national healthcare system in uh, uk nhs we looked at the nhs act we looked at the uh, two three various institutes like the uh, national institute of uh, promotion and research and mm-hmm. we also looks at looked at briefly the kings fund <coughs> sorry which basically looks at uh, making us understand that how the nhs constitution actually works and within the constitution uh, you know the the nhs act the peace trusts and how they all put together this delivery of services which are then utilized by various uh, you know people and patients uh, mm-hmm. in general the public within the uk now to a certain extent after that we studied what are the national and international impacts of uh you know healthcare system uh, sorry healthcare policy on the uk healthcare system so their coordination with <coughs> sorry the agencies like the world healthcare agency in particular unesco in particular so we briefly understood you know the 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 point working in some cases uh, you have to look at when they are contributing budgets or uh, you know doing programs jointly to help in development of r&d or research and development for you know new drugs new uh, systems to take care of patients and also to a certain extent if there is a international catastrophe for example when we looked at uh, you know international outbreak of any uh, particular disease for example we looked at the ebola which happened in uh, you know west africa mm-hmm. last early, early last year you know beginning of last year we looked at a coordinated response from the international community to be able to look at helping the uh, country out and a lot of contribute countries voluntarily contributed you know medicine and budgets and other things to look at uh, rolling out you know some sort of a plan contingency plan to control the outbreak of that virus mm-hmm. and to a certain extent what we have also looked at is what is the uh, what is the advantages what are the advantages and disadvantages of healthcare promotion so all this healthcare uh, as a system as as a means of uh, you know service is available to people within the country but to a certain extent when we look at certain issues like uh, obesity you know we everybody is living longer so this is leading to the creation of or diagnosis of new diseases new types of conditions and in those cases the nhs is trying to kind of you know promote 
the usage of uh, healthy uh, you know living which is looking at healthy food balanced diet you know working out so there's a campaign that they run under better life for example when you look at breast cancer campaigns you look at certain conditions in particular when you look at uh, uh, you know some conditions which are affecting more and more people then the national health system or nhs in this case takes care of um, you know reaching out to people public in general through the healthcare promotion route and we looked at briefly in the presentation you know uh, a promotion on um, you know breast cancer uh, certain types of cancer which you know the nhs funds and does in conjunction with third party agencies and some of these promotions we get to see on mass uh, you know advertising in terms of television hoardings and other bits so we understand we understood the role of how sometimes in order to promote good health and also to uh, to promote uh, healthy living uh, the healthcare system in a particular country also has to invest money into marketing to raise awareness uh, through the route of promotions so that it generally makes the uh, you know the patients and the people in the mass public aware of the uh, advantages of healthy living and you know exercising and things like that which in the long run reduces burden and costs on the system uh, so that people one are aware of the types of services they can get and the second is if they are aware of these conditions which can affect them at a later stage it is prevention is better than cure and the promotion aspect of it actually helps to uh, you know get this message out there to the mass public and uh, people in general to uh, make sure that the healthcare system functions effectively <clears throat> now in the last outcome what we are going to do is anything that we have not studied you know in the context of international healthcare the policy the implementation the development of the policy and its uh, you know um, and its availability of services to various aspects like gp surgeries care clinics hospitals and trusts what we are going to do is understand that in learning outcome 5 wherein what we look at is we understand what are the contemporary issues Uh, which are involved in healthcare so when we look at contemporary issues issues which are basically you know uh, what do we classify as contemporary issues now contemporary if you look at just the meaning of the word contemporary it means any uh, you know particular event or occurrence which happens outside the norm that means <clears throat> if i have to go to uh, say if i have to go and pick my kids up from school the normal route that i take would be that i go, drive uh, you know i you know drive the car and obviously go to the school to pick them up and that's a normal course that you take on a daily basis but on certain occasions because there's a traffic jam or there is uh, you know some sort of an issue with the car for example if it's not uh, uh, you know it's at the garage then what you tend to do is you would end up taking a bus or you would end up taking a taxi now that would become a contemporary route that means you are deviating from the norm to be able to do that task so contemporary issues are issues which are basically um you know uh, things or uh, you know it could be called as implications uh, you know uh, or conditions which are normally not present at a given point in time and you have to address them to be able to sort them out in the future so when i say <clears throat> that this could happen in the future now because that thing has not happened and that is something that you cannot anticipate that will become something called a contemporary issue now in the case of healthcare when we look at the contemporary issues would look at referring to issues which are current or issues which are recurring again and again and are basically situations which we have to deal on a daily basis but for which we don't have a set procedure to deal with them is that okay, okay. so this you need to understand from a point of view of looking at uh, what are contemporary issues so contemporary issues would be defined as any issues and i put a definition here in the uh, you know in the slide notes are issues which have implications applicability relevance and significant and affect the material present uh, you know presence in any given time and they mm -hmm. have to be sorted in a particular fashion or in a particular time frame would be classified as something called contemporary issues. so when we look at defining them just to simplify its definition the contemporary issues refer to current or occurring issues in health, in healthcare sector 
right? So mm-hmm. when you look at some sort of bugs or viruses, when people are admitted in hospital, when you look at the norovirus or you know mm-hmm. uh, some sort of a virus which is now not being able to treat. Uh, when we look at cleaning the wards and cleaning the beds, because that virus still leads to infections and the antibiotics have become resistant, or the, the virus has become resistant to the antibiotic, they would be classified as something called contemporary issues because we don't have a current solution for that, but we are trying to treat it with the same uh, you know, solutions or antibiotics or solutions that we have, and they then try and bring it under some sort of control, but they are not fully under control. So they will be called as contemporary issues. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? Now, yeah, these issues yeah. include issues which we face in hospital care standards. It could be elderly care, you know, people who are living in the care homes. If they have issues in terms of standards uh, that we are not able to provide, say, for example, um, clean beds, linen, and things like, for example, three meals or, you know, some sort of facilities which are required in the elderly care homes, then would be classified as issues which are contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. Some of the issues when we look at funding, related to funding, that means government is looking at austerity, they are cutting down on funds, or in general, they are moving funds which were applicable for, say, nursing homes or care homes, but they have now been moved to uh, the hospital or care trust, could also be classified as contemporary issues because budgeting in the healthcare system goes up and down, depending on the uh, you know, availability of funds. To a certain extent, in certain cases, what we see is when there is no budget availability or no funds availability to uh, have a budget, then it also becomes a contemporary issue. <clears throat> so what we are seeing is the health secretary, Jeremy John, you know, Jeremy Hunt, is trying to look at having GPs and surgeries open seven days a week. Mm-hmm. But he's not able to have the surgeries work seven days a week so that patients have access to their GPs because of one of the contemporary issues which is budgeting that means there is not enough budget available within the nhs to open surgeries on the weekends correct so funding in this case becomes a contemporary issue that means it's an everlasting issue that means it's an issue which is lingering on and on and on and because there is not there is no set specific solution for it that is why we classify it as a contemporary issue okay now, in order to study contemporary issues, what we need to be able to do is we need to look at uh, borrowing from what we've learned in Learning Outcome 4, things like the role of promotion, media, and the reliability and validity of information. Now, there are lots of things which, for example, President Donald Trump has said that this is fake news, that is fake news, right? The reason why he talks about it is that because there is no sanctity in terms of reliability, and validity of that information, he terms it as fake news. So similarly, when we look at issues, there are lots of issues which we think of within the healthcare system are problems essentially. And those problems are classified as issues, but how do we differentiate them? How do we differentiate these problems from something which is a genuine problem, from something which is a non-genuine problem or a problem which has been created uh, or is being perceived as a problem, but it is actually not a problem. So what we have to do is to understand them, we have to basically segregate these into, um, uh, you know, certain categories. And these categories have to then have reliability, you know, can only be considered reliable if we have a data kind of backing that issue. Now, if we say, and most of the things that we get to hear from our GP surgery is that we don't get enough funds. We don't get enough funds. That's why they don't prescribe say, for example, antibiotics or, you know, they don't have surgeries open over the weekend. Now, what's the data behind it? The data that is required to classify that as an issue would be the number of appointments which are happening on a daily basis. How many patients is the GP seeing? What is the ratio of the patients to the GP? That means in a surgery, if there are 5,000 patients registered uh, and there are only 10 GPs, that means the ratio of uh, patient to GP is about 1 is 2. 500, correct? Now, if sometimes you have to see the GP, that means if in in this case, if one GP is responsible for 500 patients, then if they have to seek an appointment, uh, then in those cases, you would see that if he sees about 10 patients a day, that means a repeat appointment for that patient will come typically after 50 days or about eight to nine weeks. And is this an issue? It can be treated as an issue provided there is enough data 
to justify that this is the case and you know uh, that uh, yes that would mean that if the patient has to see the gp again his appointment would come after you know typically so many days so mm-hmm. in order to back it up we have to look at the information which is available and the validity of that information which is available so that we can clearly classify it as a problem or an issue and that would then be classified as you know an ongoing issue or a contemporary issue mm-hmm. <clears throat> now what are the contemporary issues in healthcare management when we look at we look at issues which are classified here so there are issues which are strategic financial human resource led operational is there are issues which are related to reforms and there are issues related to the quality of care being delivered these are the six different categories that we can classify issues into when we look at contemporary issues in healthcare okay so <laughs> an example of this would be if there are lots of patients in a gp surgery and there is no online booking system for taking appointments then this is an operational issue that means if the lines open at 8:30 in the morning and they close at 9 o'clock and all the appointments are gone for the day that means people keep trying and they get a busy tone but because they are not able to reach the reception they might have been trying but in the queue but all the rece- uh, appointments have gone for that day so this turns out to be what is a operational issue that means the gp surgery should implement an online appointment system that means the customers or their patients registered with the surgery can actually go online and take the appointment without having to wait in a queue on the phone to be able to take or confirm appointments so this as an issue if complaints start to come in that okay i am not able to get an appointment i keep calling on the phone but they are always busy that means that becomes an operational issue and it can be sorted provided they have something which is like an online operation uh, appointment booking system okay mm-hmm. now when we look at other issues for example <clears throat> sometimes we see that there are issues related to uh, you know financial issues financial issues would be that you've had an operation at the hospital and the operation has not gone well and it has led to complications so the patient decides to sue the hospital or the authorities to get compensation and that could become a financial issue so there are news i don't know whether you see but there are there are lots of pieces of news which which are coming uh, you know from time to time that there are lots of these lawyers which actually fleece nhs of so much funds because mm-hmm. of wrong cases and wrong doings and i think it was a headline news i think two or three weeks back wherein there was a figure of 460 million which was said that there are greedy lawyers which make false cases and nhs is being you know kind of fleeced for this money uh, because of this uh, uh, you know financial uh, you know litigation system happening within the nhs Uh-huh. Uh-huh. right so some of these contemporary issues we can look at examples of and these then can be looked at issues which are uh, you know because they are issues which are backed up by data and issues which are backed up by information and it is reliable that is why we classify them as contemporary issues one of the strategic issues could be you know there is an issue which now we know in nhs that nhs is starved of funds that means there is um not adequate funding to f- fund all the services which the national health service needs to provide now this is a strategic issue because the government is looking into ways of bolstering the budget for nhs they announced last year in the budget that you know with the brexit happening that would mean that would free up extra 2 billion which could be invested into nhs as a budget uh, to you know uh, like kind of Uh, make funds available for frontline services like ene department in particular now because this is an ongoing issue and budgeting is always an issue with nhs in terms of the funds whatever government gives is less they are also starting off something which is the system of uh, you know savings or cost savings within the nhs to do away with expensive contracts which which is providing uh, you know profitability to private companies as against and uh, providing services and there are other options available so this then becomes finance and you know when we look at cost cutting and budgeting as an issue is more of a strategic issue because it is long term and it affects everybody in the long term in terms of nhs not being able to fund its services or fund its services to provide uh, you know uh, these things to the public in general okay now <clears throat> one of the things we also look at is sometimes you see a lot of things being talked about in the news 
but that does not mean that it is related to uh, you know the national health service or that issue is directly related or contributing to becoming a problem uh, as far as providing these services so what we look at is in the in in this particular context we also study the role of media what is the role of news the role of news is they they kind of you know are significant because they are the ones which capture the news and then present it to the people in terms of you know uh, happenings or events which are which are relevant to the national health service so the media has a role to play in this uh, uh, whole uh, you know what you call aspect is because they need to be able to inform people about what the national health service is providing and in what the national health service is not providing where they are suffering and because of which the services are suffering so when we look at the role of media they look at you know things like if there's an outbreak of virus or if there's an outbreak of any epidemic then the media is the first one to be able to communicate to mass public that this has happened that has happened and you need to take these precautions so it plays a very important role in dissemination of information to the mass public when certain outbreaks happen let's look at the role of media there is recently something which nhs was affected with can you recall what the nhs or most of the hospitals in west midlands yorkshire were affected with in england in particular a couple of weeks back sorry sorry you know most of the hospitals in west yorkshire uh, you know mid midlands and england were affected a couple of weeks back by a particular outbreak can you think of what why they were in the news no i didn't, I didn't hear. <laughs> right okay no worries you, I'll, I'll 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 mention this to you and i think you'll be able to relate to that you know there was a cyber attack on some of the hospitals in the last few weeks and because of which a lot of operations and a lot of procedures had to be delayed or postponed because a lot of operational equipment in the clinical equipment in the hospitals was not uh, you know was under attack by cyber uh, you know terrorists or there was a hacking uh, involved in the hospitals do you recall this news i don't know whether you recall this news or not but it was national news cyber uh, hacks for england hospitals this was major news you know because i think there were some about 80 90 uh, you know hospitals or uh, you know uh, some 200 odd gp surgeries which were attacked uh, by you know they faced a cyber attack and because of which they had to postpone operations and you know procedures and you know basic things which were happening in those hospitals so if you see this was a big news nhs cyber attack last scale uh, sorry last scale you know uh, hacks plunges hospitals into chaos so this was uh, something in the news uh, you know in the month of may a june in particular hello so we also had you know these attacks happening in scotland in particular so the role of media when we look at is important is because of the fact that they have a role to play in informing people about the status of affairs in the health and social care sector and sometimes they are able to communicate news or come, come, you know basically in share information in the form of breaking news in terms of outbreaks of diseases like the ebola virus which we spoke about a couple of uh, you know minutes back and also in the case of you know some uh, new treatments or drugs which are brought in uh, uh, or introduced by you know nhs and nhs related contracting contractors so the media has a very important role because they also play um you know they have uh, they have an important role in also influencing the attitudes and behavior of the people in context to the health and social care sector and the role of uh, you know nhs and uh, the services it provides within the particular system so they also hold to a certain extent the public services to account under the freedom of information act if you have heard you know which was introduced in 2010 they can actually seek out information from uh, the nhs the nhs act and the healthcare uh, department in particular within the government healthcare department to bring out pieces of information which then can be shared with you know uh, public in general so there is a very important role which media plays 
in particular when we looked uh, you know at the healthcare system one of the key things that you will need to remember is obviously the healthcare act uh, you know the uh, freedom of information act the freedom of information act allows the media to be able to pull out information and share that in the public domain under uh, this act which was introduced in 2010 and this act then allows the media to seek information from public services public departments the healthcare department in general to to be able to get information on the services being provided the budgets being uh, you know allocated the spending happening and then share that with public and because they are able to get access to this information uh, you know from various sources this um, information can be validated and it is reliable and the dissemination of this information happening uh, you know on by the media under the freedom of information act is then information that which can be shared accurately and reliably with you know the uh, public in general okay now the other bits that we look at is how we look at um, you know understanding uh, what is the impact of uh, you know the healthcare policy on some of the international issues now when we look at um, the policy which has been developed by nhs or by uk government in particular under the nhs what we do get to see is that they have looked at uh, you know creating creation of this policy by looking at things which can affect the services which nhs provides now to give you an example what i would basically say is that if there is an outbreak of a particular uh, you know disease for example if there is an outbreak of uh, um, say say for example because there are excessive rains which happen during the winter months accumulation of water um, you know in some uh, in some places can lead to uh, you know creation of uh, the let's put it this way the mosquito or you know it can lead to fever dengue fever in, and it leads to high risk in the case when it uh, it is detected and you know the larvae can actually survive even after the water has dried up but it can lead to obviously wide scale spreading of say dengue which is a kind of a fever or a malaria kind of a fever which is create, you know kind of uh, let's put it this way um it is spread by mosquitoes now this happens in developing countries now somebody coming into the uk say for example if you've gone on a holiday and you've got affected by this condition but you could then bring this back into the uk because you're traveling back to the home country and you would want to receive treatment here in the uk as against uh, you know for this when you were out on a holiday so because you are able to bring this back as a as a as a disease or as a symptom when you are traveling back in those cases what the system has to do is it has to create provisions for uh, you know treatment which is um, for diseases or uh, you know for example in this case uh, issues which are not particularly present in the uk but is are present outside the uk so an example that i wanted to quote here was that if you are traveling abroad on a holiday and you uh, get affected by say dengue uh, then you are at high risk in terms of um, you know uh, because you run high fever and other bits and pieces and this bit can also be transmitted um, when you travel back to the uk so here what the provisions which the uh, healthcare policy does is it creates uh, a system wherein certain types of conditions which can be brought in or imported from outside the uk by its own uh, people can then be treated safely within when you arrive back uh, into uk so i've gone on a holiday outside i've got uh, affected by uh, you know uh, mosquito bites and i've developed dengue fever but i don't want to get treatment done in say for example my holiday destination i decide to travel back but i'm traveling back with the same condition and what happens is when i go into the gp surgery they say okay you've developed this but because if we had not created treatment or not created provision for this treatment because it is not a disease generally prevalent in the uk but in emerging countries then there was no way that the person could have received treatment in the uk so when you look at policy creation sometimes the governments have to look at inclusion or creation of provision for such diseases to be treated within their geography even if they are not being diagnosed or uh, is something which they cannot be affected with but they have to have provisions for it is that something which is clear yeah yeah, yeah. so um, mm -hmm. a simple example of that would be that for example i 
um, you know, for example, in my case, uh, let's put it this way. You look at obesity, the reverse side of it is you look at obesity, smoking, alcoholism. These are now problems which we are facing in developed countries, but these are also problems in developing countries, right? Eat, eat so yeah, yeah. So even if you look at increasing westernization, which is happening in developing countries, what we do get to see is that a lot of people are now smoking, a lot of people have access and they have, because of the living standards, they're able to smoke and they are able to have alcohol or expensive liquor, which is leading to conditions which are generally seen within developed countries, you know? So in our, if, if I look at countries like emerging markets, like African countries, India, China, you look at countries like India, wherein people normally would spend money on buying food and, you know, other basic things rather than spending money on alcohol or smoking because they do not earn enough to be able to uh, uh, kind of afford these luxuries. So if mm -hmm. they develop a condition like, uh, you know, serious liver failure or, uh, you know, severe bronchitis in lungs because of smoking, these are things that we get to see in developed countries, wherein, you know, the economic levels are quite high uh, and people have access, easy access to these kind of things. So what I'm trying to say here is sometimes when the healthcare policy is made, even if it's being made by a country which is not very advanced, they have to look at making provisions for those policy, uh, you know, diseases or conditions which are not pre pre prevalent in the country in, in a large scale. So if I have to go to a country like India, for example, there mm -hmm. alcohol, a lot of people do not consume alcohol because it is, a, 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 you know, it's considered not safe in their religion. It is not prescribed. But because of increasing westernization, what is happening now is a lot of younger generation or the modern generation is now drinking a lot of alcohol. And because they have their systems have been such that they have not created provisions for treating alcohol conditions, that means that in this case, what they want to be able to do now is increase or include a policy and bring it into their uh, you know uh, uh, policy framework to have people being treated for alcohol or conditions related to alcohol. So sometimes when you look at provision of healthcare and creation of healthcare policy, what you look at is that you have to sometimes look at including uh, context of diseases or uh, you know uh, symptoms or problems which are uh, not generally applicable to your country, but because they can be exported from other countries uh, over a point in time, you have to have provisions for them to be. Uh, you know, taken care of or, you know, uh, provide uh, solutions or, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at when we have talked about a lot of issues, contemporary issues, contemporary issues. Let's look at what are the top five healthcare issues identified by, you know, uh, um, a website called Health Watch. Now, Health Watch is a network which basically, uh, you know, looks at uh, creating a database of issues um, w within the UK and they talk about, uh, you know, the top five, top 10 issues which are going to be affecting us in the future. Mm -hmm. What they've done is they have a network of, uh, you know, um, um, say agencies through which they collect data and they mm -hmm. do have surveys to be able to identify what are the top five or top, you know, 10 issues that uh, the sector could face uh, going forward. Now, one of the key things that we are looking at is if because we are living longer and the life expectancy in general is increasing, we see a lot of mental health services issues now cropping up, things like dementia, you know, Alzheimer's disease. These are issues which are cropping up because uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, westernization style, style, of, uh, style of lifestyle and also yes. because we are living longer. So access to and quality of mental health care services is being raised as one of the biggest issues which NHS now needs to address because as people live longer and these new types of disorders, diseases which are being diagnosed require a creation of a mental health services division within the NHS to provide services and to take care of patients. Okay. Uh -huh. The second issue which they talk about is primary care issue which is related to primary care services. And we talk about the access to GPs and dentists here. That means most surgeries, most uh, hospitals have an issue in terms of staffing. That means they are not able to have enough qualified staff who are able to work 
within this uh, sector and because they do not have qualified staff it puts pressure on the existing people working and this is exerting pressure on them to be able to provide services but this is leading to compromise so when we talk about the things like um, you know um, uh, what we talk about the things like for example um, GP surgeries when Jerryman wants to open them for seven days a week but what they mm -hmm. say because if we have to open on the weekends we have GPs who will have to do locums and for locums uh, or locum GPs they'll have to pay fees and services now because there is not ample budgeting available this becomes an issue because you're not able to open surgeries over the weekend but because you're not able to open surgeries over the weekend that means access to GPs in general for patients registered with that surgery is decreasing you know so if you have to seek an appointment in some cases you get appointments after a month or after yeah. four to six weeks and this then becomes one of the clear issue which is a primary care issue that means if you have a problem and you have a symptom who do you go to first you go to your surgery isn't it you don't go to mm -hmm. the so GP. That, yeah you go to gp so what is happening is because people are not able to get appointments with gp surgeries they are going into a and e and this is putting a reverse pressure on a and e departments to be able to deal with you know patients which actually should be dealt with surgeries in the first hand so primary care services in terms of services to be made available from gp surgeries care homes are the second most important and the third most important issues which they have identified now other issues which they have identified the number 4 and 5 are services working better together that means the system has become so big it has become so fragmented that what is now happening is that if you are faced with a particular problem you go to the surgery surgery refers you to the hospital you go to a hospital they refer to a consultant you go to a consultant they say okay you have a 4 to 6 weeks wait time and you have to get this procedure done in such and such place so services are not being uh, you know the these uh, uh, these uh, hospitals or these setups which have been created are not able to provide services in a in in a in a unison manner but they are being fragmented because the system has become too big and the big because of the uh, you know scale of the operation sometimes we do get to see that they are not able to work together to be able to provide that service uh, to the patient or to the uh, people availing that service so in some cases getting hold of quality service is becoming an issue right and this is an issue for example if you have been diagnosed with say for example uh, a blockage and uh, you have been diagnosed with a blockage so what you do is your gp surgery recommends you go to the uh, hospital and you see a cardiologist or a consultant the cardiologist will do a number of tests with you like a stress test an ecg Oh, and then after that, what they would suggest is that you need to undergo a clinical procedure. But from that stage to undergoing a clinical procedure, there's a huge wait. And because the system has become too big, sometimes things are not available. What is happening is that the quality of service services are suffering. And the patient is able to not see getting hold of this service through one particular banner. But they have been asked to go to different departments, different places to be able to get that procedure done. Now, we also see one of the issues which they've identified is hospital discharge. That means people are being discharged, uh, are not being discharged at the right time and are not being provided the right aftercare required once they are discharged after a clinical procedure or an operation. So hospital discharge is being done in some cases quite uh, quickly wherein the patient's care is suffering and there is no post care being provided for in certain cases when the patient has undergone some sort of a clinical op procedure or an operation. Is that okay? Yeah. So these are some of the big issues which we have identified uh, from a point of view of, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, issues which the uh, healthcare system in general faces uh, within the UK. Now, let's look at some of the issues which could arrive because of, uh, say, Brexit vote, you know. There is a lot of discussion that, you know, 55% uh, or not 55, so about, there are about 148,000 people or 150,000 people which are employed within this sector. Now, 55,000 people of those 150,000 are basically, in terms of the workforce, is basically from the European Union. Now, if 
e uk is to exit without securing the rights of these citizens living in the uk and who work within the nhs or the as uh, work as a healthcare professional hcp then in those cases what will happen is staffing in the nhs will become one of the biggest issues isn't it mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. You, lots of nurses um there was a news that um, you know a lot of people are now leaving their jobs in the nhs and going back is because there is not yet an agreement between uk and the eu in securing the rights of people who are staying in the uh, uk and have been traditionally you know eu citizens so once their rights are secured then their jobs are secured and obviously from that point of view that <clears throat> that insecurity which a lot of people have that what will happen because uh, you know once the uk leaves the eu what will happen is that my rights will not be no longer protected because i am a european citizen uh, but uh, in that case you know um, uh, i might be asked to leave or i must be kind of you know made redundant from my job because i don't have a british nationality and things like that so staffing is one of the issues which is being discussed uh, in a great detail specifically related to the healthcare sector the financial services sector because of london being the financial hub and this is one of the biggest issues which the government has to solve uh, in in order for the eu nationals to be able to continue to work within the national health service okay and because mm-hmm. the people working with the within the nhs is quite high that means they have to reach some sort of an agreement so that this does not become uh, or remain an issue once uk has left the european union okay okay the other bit is when you know i don't know whether you noticed or seen that we have access to a facility called the ehic card european health insurance card now when we travel to holidays in europe what we can do is because uh, we have the ehic card if we are to fall ill or if we need to seek any treatment then that means we can actually go into any particular gp surgery or a clinic in any location within the eu and we can receive the basic treatment because we are a part and parcel of the european uh, union so far and the ehic card which allows us to get access to med- medical facilities allows this facility to be availed absolutely free of cost okay right so if yeah. i'm traveling to france for example and i fall in and i need uh, to get some medicine i can go to any local surgery there and then show my european health insurance card and that card allows me to receive a prescription and medicine absolutely free of cost okay because i'm a uk, uh, UK citizen which is a part of eu at this moment but when we leave and when brexit happens the government needs to negotiate the status of if we most of us travel to europe for holidays when we go on holidays what will happen in that case do we need to get uh, take out private medical insurance will the hospitals and the clinics and the surgeries be able to see us if we need those uh, services when i'm not well and things like that that is something again which is a broader issue which they need to solve before we exit the european union okay mm-hmm. now in some cases when we look at uh, one of the issues is regulation you know currently all the laws that we follow the european court of justice can override any law uh, or any such ruling within the uk or by uk so uk supreme court now when we leave the eu what will happen is we need to develop some of our own regulations or revert back to some of the regulations which were there law and legislation regulation which was there before we joined the european union so when we leave the eu we will have to create our parallel laws to be able to deal with and have that regulation in place right so one of the key things that we study under this is that under the european law you know what we say is the full time working week is how, how how many hours 48 no 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 uh, yeah, yeah no in short 48 the full time working week is 37.5 hours 37.5 yeah 37.5 or say down figure 40 hours because every week if you have to work normal hours the european working direct directive basically says that if you are cons- you are considered working full time if mm-hmm. you are working over 35 hours as per the uh, working directive of uh, european union now in the uk when we say that you are working full time what we do mean by that is that we are working full time means we are working 37.5 hours 
mm-hmm. but in the case of doctors when we look at the working time regulations stipulate that they can on an average work up to 48 hours a week and nothing more nothing less and that is considered you know the working time directive for gps in particular okay so for us my working full time means i am working 37.5 hours and that is considered full time or 40 hours that is considered full time but in the okay. case of a gp mm-hmm. what we look at is that if they are working 48 hours they can work this particular period um, you know they have to work 48 hour weeks to be able to consider working full time and beyond this they will not be able to work because this puts a lot of stress and compromises the kind of services they provide if they work more than 48 hours similarly the working time directive for pilots people who fly aircrafts is stipulated at 70 hours if i am correct i think working time directive for pilots mm-hmm. i think is 70 hours or 150 hours a month one wow. second we just double check so it's i uh, know it's 22 hours right 22 hours a week so they cannot fly for more than 22 hours at a stretch under the working time directive now these regulations have been put in place because they want them to understand that people under certain jobs have certain stresses and for certain professions any working hour more than this working hours would mean that they are providing compromised service or it can lead to risks and it can lead to mitigation in terms of you know not being able to provide right kind of services to their patients so when you look at gps so gps is 48 hours when you look at pilots it's 22 hours so this regulation is the third issue when we look at identifying it in a bit more detail is that we have to look at coming out with something which relates to this once we leave the eu so some cases we also look at uh this being an issue but there is a uh, international coordination to understand that if you have certain people working in certain professions that they are not they should not be allowed to work beyond these hours because beyond these hours if they continue to provide service then this can lead to compromise or uh, you know this could mean drop in the quality of service which these kind of people provide so for mm-hmm. gps or doctors it is stipulated at 48 hours at a stretch they can work beyond that they have to be given you know a week off and after that they have to again do 48 hour shifts okay, okay. now mm-hmm. similar concept of when we look at you know international coordinated effort on epidemics or problems which are going beyond the country so ebola virus was actually a uh, catastrophe or you know a developing condition which spread across to four different countries congo mm-hmm. nigeria you know western nigeria western ghana so a couple of countries were affected and that meant that one country's government could not or one com- uh, country's healthcare sector could not cope with that demand and that required international effort to contain that particular epidemic like you look at hurricane katrina now or you know the recent hurricane which has devastated a lot of uh, you know places in the caribbean so you look at cuba puerto rico you know a lot of other british overseas territories that has meant that it needs international cooperation to be able to deal with that problem isn't it mm-hmm. those kind of things sometimes you look at when we look at dealing with these kind of issues in particular and these are all you know called you know contemporary issues because the issues which sometimes require not just one country's healthcare system but some other you know international have to be able to coordinate all this is that okay uh-huh. so the other slides you know basically cover uh, give you example of hiv again be something which requires international coordination you know and this is where sometimes some countries have to look at funding creation of funds you know we give a lot of overseas aids to be able to prevent some of diseases or uh, you know problems happening in countries so that they cannot be exported back into the uk and that is all under the context of contemporary issues in health and social care both in the national as well as in the international context mm-hmm. okay so that brings us to the end of you know the, this particular unit i'm going to do is send you a copy of this presentation and along with that i will send you a copy of this handout 
which four page handout which talks about contemporary issues which uh, you know the ethnic minorities which is black uh, asian uh -huh. minorities faced within uh, you know the uk so this is a extract report which talks about what are the contemporary issues which can be identified under the national health service or in general across uh, you know the healthcare system slightly mm -hmm. old in terms of it's a report which was compiled in 2013 that talks about and gives you the overview of what we discussed in some more details in terms of why these are considered you know uh, contemporary issues uh, in particular okay, okay? yeah so i'm i'm going to end